All right, yeah, we can get started. Um, good afternoon. My name is Clark Packard. I'm a resident fellow at the R Street Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, tomorrow marks the 20th anniversary of China's accession to the World Trade Organization, which ushered in profound changes to the rules-based trading system. Um, I'll be moderating our panel today um, entitled China and the WTO, a 20-year review. Uh, I hope it's a rich conversation. Um, just sort of some housekeeping here. Uh, I'll introduce our panelists. I'll make some brief remarks to kind of set the stage uh, and then start with questions. Uh, I envision this being sort of in an informal, uh, free-flowing conversation. I may jump in um, on some of the substance, uh, but I'll leave some time at the end for some questions from the audience. Um, and first I will introduce our panelists, all of whom I learn a lot from. Um, first is Simon Lester. He's president of the newly launched Chinatrademonitor.com. Previously, Simon was associate director of the Cato Institute's Trade Policy Center and has practiced law in the WTO's appellate body, secretariat, and taught international trade law and at a number of law schools around the U.S. and the world. Uh, Juan Zhou is, a, is vice president and co-founder of the China Trade Monitor. Uh, she also used to work at the Cato Institute's Trade Policy Center, where she primarily researched U.S.-China trade relations, WTO neg negotiations, uh, and disputes, and China's trade and investment laws and policies. Finally, Dr. Mary Lovely is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics and a professor of economics at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. She's a leading scholar on China's economy. So with that, I will make some brief remarks and we will get going with some questions. Um, at, at the outset, let me state that I think China engages in, in some repressive human rights practices and troubling foreign policy practices. Uh, but today's discussion will focus mostly on the US economic relationship between China or with China and as well as the World Trade Organization. Um, so with that, uh, in the 1970s, China was one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, it had a population of about a billion people, yet it engaged in little international trade and investment. Um, in 1978, Chinese Premier Deng Xiaoping began to open the economy, moving away from rigid central planning and toward liberalizing markets. Uh, as Dartmouth economist Doug Irwin, Mary's Peterson Institute colleague, has written in his masterful history of US trade policy uh, entitled Clashing Over Commerce, quote, these policy reforms led to a dramatic acceleration in China's economic growth and sparked a rapid expansion in its foreign trade. China's share of world exports rose from a minuscule proportions in 1980 to 5% in 2000, reaching 12% in 2014. In 1980, President Carter opened trade with China by allowing its goods to be given most favored nation status instead of being subjected to much higher non-MFN duties. The Trade Act of 1974 gave the president the authority to grant communist countries MFN status on an annual basis, provided Congress did not vote to disapprove of that decision. Every year, presidents of both parties would continue granting China MFN status, even after the brutal crackdown at Tiananmen Square. Uh, in 1985, China applied to join the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the predecessor of today's World Trade Organization. In 1995, the GATT was converted into the WTO, uh, and that same year China applied to join, formally join the WTO. Washington, Beijing, and other countries began uh, negotiating uh, the terms under which China could join the WTO. Through a series of intense negotiations, the United States agreed to grant China permanent MFN status in exchange for China agreeing to abide by WTO rules, a set of WTO plus, uh, China specific WTO plus commitments and it cut tariffs from an average of 25% down to 9%. In October of 2000, President Bill Clinton signed legislation granting China permanent normal trade relations, PNTR, which paved the way for Beijing's entry into the World Trade Organization uh, again 20 years ago tomorrow. In many respects, this was the high point of globalization. It ushered in dramatic changes to the rules-based trading system and optimism abounded. Uh, fast forward to 2018, uh, when the United States Trade Representative issued a report that served as sort of an indictment of sorts of Chinese commercial practices. 
Uh, in response, the United States and China levied tariffs back and forth. Today, nearly 70% of imports uh, from China are covered by tariffs that average about 20%. Uh, and that's up from about 3% before the back and forth started. In early 2020, the US and China signed the so-called phase one agreement, uh, a temporary detente, uh, essentially promising to stop tariff reprisals. Uh, and both sides made some commitments, including purchase commitments for American products and some minor structural promises from Beijing. Um, so with that, I will sort of begin the, the process of asking some questions. Um, and let's start at sort of the high level um, and, and I'll just go around uh, to the panelists. What, what were your reflections sort of on the late 90s negotiation and the initial accession? And I can start with Simon. Thanks, Clark. Uh, thanks for having me. And that was a great overview you just gave to everybody. So, um, yeah, on the accession and late 1990s, I will confess that, that, that at that time I was focused on East Asia, but it was more Japan and South Korea. So I wish I had sort of lived through it and, and followed it as, a, as it went along, but it didn't. So I've had to go play catch up, um, you know, reading people's accounts of the negotiations. And so here's a, a great book, uh, the Paul Blue, no, it looks backwards there, Paul Bluestein's Schism book. Um, and so I, I sort of read through that to get a sense of, of what the negotiators were thinking and listen to, to some of the others speaking the past couple of days. And it seems to me that what we had with this negotiation was a hard fought negotiation on both sides between the US and China. You had other people, other countries negotiating with China as well. The US was the big one. And the, the deal that we got looks to me like a pretty good one from the US perspective. If you read through the accession protocol and what China agreed to, uh, they agreed to a lot and, and things that I'm a little surprised that they did. So I think the U.S. pushed really hard and they got a lot of things, a lot of good, a lot of good things there. Now, one of the problems, I think, um, is that when politicians try to sell these trade deals, uh, they, they overdo it a bit. And there's always this sort of hype about how many jobs will create and how, how wonderful this will be and it will transform, uh, you know, maybe chi transform China's economy and political system. And you can read things like Bill Clinton's speech uh, you know, famous speech about this. And, you know, I think if you take it literally, you would say, oh, you know, he, he thinks this is going to bring democracy to China. But, you know, I, I read that speech and it looks to me like it's more hopeful than predictive. I mean, yes, they, people in, in the U.S. and the West hoped that this would bring China, uh, would, would change its political system a bit, moving it towards democracy, moving it towards free markets. But I, I think people were mostly pretty clear-eyed um, about China's political system and in, in terms of the economic system, hoping for more sort of gradual changes um, as opposed to sort of a, a radical transformation to, to a free market. Um, so, you know, I, I think that when you think about, you know, why they did it and what, whether it made sense uh, to bring China into the WTO, I mean, you know, you think about what's the, what's the counterfactual, um, would we be better off somehow if uh, China were not in the WTO and we were, or, or they were in the WTO, but the, the US and China weren't applying the rules um, to, uh, uh, between each other, which, which is possible, uh, so that the US could keep doing the, the normal trade relations, the MFN review um, each year. So Congress each year would have to check to see whether China would get the, you know, the normal tariffs. You know, I, I'm skeptical that, that somehow that situation would, would make us better off. And, and I, I think that, you know, when, when I look at, when I look back um, at, at how the, the U.S. trade policymakers handled it, I think they did a good job of the negotiations. I think it made sense to, to bring China in. I think we'll get into it later in the discussion kind of more specifics on that. So I'll, I'll stop there for now. Sure. Juan? Thanks, Clark. Uh, so Simon talked about from the U.S. perspective. So I wanted to talk about the, uh, from the China's perspective. I've listened to a lot of webinars lately because uh, China is celebrating its 20-year anniversary uh, to the WTO as well. And there was one event at the former uh, formal, um, Deputy Gen uh, Director General uh, of the WTO, um, Yi Xiaojun. He said he was a part of the negotiation and he said, uh, they really a struggle from learning exactly what you know market assets means, or what uh, uh, what transparency means. Until uh, at one point that they signed a deal, and even then they were very nervous. They didn't know how China will turn out to be, uh, how this relationship will pan out, and they're worried that they just uh, just 
accidentally threw China under the bus. So that was uh, the mindset of Chinese negotiators. And now looking back, they, you know, they were very proud that um, they gave up, uh, they lowered their trade barriers. Uh, they, as you said, uh, lowered the tariffs. They opened more markets to service trade. Uh, and, uh, and then they, in, in exchange, they were able to have access to more markets on an MFN basis. Uh, even though the US granted China's MFN status back in 1980s, such status didn't become permanent until China joined the WTO. So uh, since then, China's you know, trade and both imports and exports had grown substantially and, and, and it started playing a bigger and bigger role in global trade. Um, I actually grew up in China during that period, and I have seen dramatic changes of people's lives, uh, people's living standard. Uh, myself, I've seen more foreign products in the market. We have more options, uh, and other people have seen uh, better jobs and more income. Um, and you know, as Clark, you point out, uh, China used to be very poor. Back in 2000, it was almost half of the Chinese population was still under the poverty line. And nowadays, uh, only less than 1% people are still in poverty. So billions of people's lives have been changed. Uh, and I think um, even, even though China was already on the trajectory of lowering trade tariffs unilaterally uh, by opening up, um, become part of the, the accession to the WTO really accelerated its opening process. It forced China to open up in a more aggressive way uh, on a larger scale and a faster pace than what it would have done otherwise. I'll stop here. Great, Dr. Lovely. Yeah, great to join this conversation. Um, we hear a lot about the failure of President Clinton or others to take account of what was gonna happen over the next 10, 20 years as if they had a, a crystal ball. Um, clearly, I think as um, Simon mentioned, there was hype, but I think there was hype sort of on both sides. I think um, leaders in both countries knew that this would be inevitable, that, that you can't keep a country as large as China uh, perennially out of the world trading system. Um, that was just, that would have ignored facts on the ground, which is that the Chinese economy was already growing and trade was growing. Um, and, um, you know, that each side uh, used some hyperbole, shall we say, to sell it to their domestic audiences. Um, this, I think, has led to some really unhelpful revisionism and I think, frankly, some flat out, you know, misleading statements. And I think one of the ones we hear most of it, most often, is that we thought it was going to lead to a democratic China, um, which I really, at least for me at the time, I don't think I believe that. I don't know how many other Americans actually believe that. Um, and that it not only did it not, it also didn't lead to a, a marketized China. And I think that's also wrong. I think China did move forward uh, in freeing its markets very substantially. Uh, and we saw the most powerful evidence that that is a correct statement is the incredible growth that, that China joining the WTO and the complementary domestic reforms, which were absolutely essential to unleashing the power of the market. We saw tremendous productivity growth up until the great, um, you know, the, the global financial crisis. We saw, um, rapid entry, rapid exit. I used to call it the wild, wild east, you know, uh, dramatic changes in the labor market, in migration. So this huge, really societal upheaval that went along with creating uh, your markets. So we, we have a situation today where most of those markets still exist. There has been some rollback, uh, but I don't think those rollbacks or restate um, uh, control, taking back state control on some areas uh, negates the progress that were made and were unleashed by uh, China entering into the WTO. I think that this is a day to celebrate. Sure. Um, how, and again, I'll, I'll sort of go around uh, to all the panelists, but how and why, um, so, so if, if you sort of put yourself back in 2000, um, optimism abounded, uh, but Today, how, how did that optimism sort of give way to the skepticism? I think deep skepticism, 
pervasive all around Washington. Uh, and in a lot of Western capitals, uh, what, how, how do we get from there to here today? And I, I'll, I'll start with Simon. Okay, thanks, Clark. I'm, I'm going I'm to talk about one particular aspect of this, and I, and I think the others will probably come on, come in with the other more sort of conventional views. But there's one aspect that I think doesn't get enough attention, and I don't mean to suggest this is the sort of dominant thing we should all be talking about, but I, I think it's important. Um, so th there's there's a guy, you know, you people, you on the panel, and others watching this might might have uh, might know him, Evan Feigenbaum. He's a, he was a State Department official during the Bush administration, George W. Bush. And now he's at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And he recently did um, an oral history project where he talked about um, you know, a, a variety of things, but, but some of the things going on when, when he started working. And so as and you know, you'd have to go look at his oral history. I'm gonna paraphrase it a bit. He said that when he first started talking to uh, State Department people about his job there um, in, in sort of mid 2000, it was all about China. Like it was gonna be, it, the question was, you know, the foreign policy hawks versus the, the doves on China, and, and they were sort of going to be battling it out, and he was kind of hired to be on the dovish side. Um, so this was sort of mid-2000, uh, mid-2001, and um, but then 9-11 happens, and after that, China just gets demoted, and, and you know, it, it becomes all about um, Islamic terrorism, war on terror, war in Afghanistan, war in Iraq, and all of a sudden, you know, right, we're, we're, the foreign policymakers are not thinking about China so much. Um, we can't think about how to push China to, to do things on trade or, or human rights because, you know, we need their non-objection to the things we want to do um, in, in the war on terror. So, so the way I see it, so China gets into the WTO officially uh, summer 11, 2000, 2001. There was this great opportunity to have the foreign policy community, the trade policy community in the U.S., um, really focus on China's integration into the trading system, and we didn't take it. And that's not to say that people at USTR weren't paying attention. They were. Um, they, they were on top of this. But at the highest level, uh, China just, just wasn't the focus. And so we have this long period, and, and you know, those of anybody watching who was around in that period was alive and paying attention in that period, 2001 through 2011, I mean, China was just not really on the map of things that, that people cared about. It was all about um, the war on terror. In the foreign pol in foreign policy, so you know, eventually we get to this point where enthusiasm of, about uh, the anti-terror po terror policies, you know, starts to, to fade a bit. And, and and the way I see it, uh, President Obama was kind of looking for a way out, and his pivot to Asia um, was in large part about how, how do we get ourselves, you know, out of this focus on the Middle East? Um, who who else could could be something? You know, who could we focus on instead? And, and at that point, China has continued to grow and sort of sort of becomes the obvious candidate. All right. Well, now let's pivot to Asia and, and focus on China a bit. You know, there are some real concerns about China. Um, let, let's think about that. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there are, I, I, I agree, there are plenty of real concerns about China, but, but I fear that, you know, what, what happens is, um, you know, we, we overstate threats and, and we get hyperbolic, hyperbolic voices sort of controlling the debate. And so, so to, to go back to your question, yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons that we've, we've gotten to where we are is that we missed the opportunity um, to deal with what was going to be a, a really difficult problem, integrating China into the trading system. And you know, we, we went off in this, uh, this other direction. So that, again, that's not, that it's maybe not the most important point here. It's certainly not the only point, but it's one that I think gets, that gets overlooked and I wanted to kind of put it out, put it into the debate. Sure, Juan? Yeah. Um, uh... I want to find out uh, one part that's usually missing uh, that people were not realizing here is that the 2008 financial crisis uh, was like a wake up call to the Chinese leadership. We often hear people talk about uh, China change its course of development around you know, 2007, 2008 period. And nowadays a lot of were blamed on uh, President Xi who is more, uh, more aggressive and um, more about controlling authoritarian you know, 
controlling everything. Um, but it actually was the 2008 financial crisis and China realized the, the economic model set by the US is not perfect. So, and then China's survival of the financial crisis actually boasted uh, their confidence in their own economic model, which relies more on state intervention than uh, the US and other Western countries model. So, um, you know, uh, nowadays we hear people complain about, you know, because of what China did and it, China did not meet its commitment under the WTO, it uh, did not um, develop or op continue to open up, um, they are going backwards and therefore we are uh, disappointed and the whole deal is, you know, it's, it's bad, it's a bad decision. Uh, but just, I wanted to point out that this is, something happened on the, the Chinese leader's mind uh, that usually are overlooked here. Great, Dr. Lovely. Yeah, I think this is really interesting. Um, I'm glad Simon raised 9-11 because I, I was also thinking about 9-11 this morning and the impact that it had um, on US policy. And, um, in a, it, it, we took our eye off the ball, I think is one way to put what he's saying. And I, I, I would um, kind of just play off of that a little bit and say, I think it, it, we took our eye off the ball in two ways that are important. One is we didn't think about integrating China in the world econ economy in a way that we felt uh, embodied the values of uh, the WTO and the US after all was the leader <laughs> of the world trading system for a long time. So we feel like we know those rules pretty well. I'm not sure we always do, but uh, especially lately, but nevertheless. Um, and in particular, I think there are a couple of things. First, the failure of US exports to China to really uh, boom to the same extent that U.S. exports imports did. Now, part of that is just China's place in the global supply uh, system. Uh, we don't have to run a trade uh, balance with every country. In fact, that would be an abnormal situation. Um, but we know there were other reasons why, including an overvalued currency. If exports had had increased more steadily, I think that we would have had more. We would today be hearing more voices of moderation, um, but that didn't happen. And I think partly that was because US eyes were looking the other way. Um, I, I think that um, another way in which we took our eye off the ball was moving toward the Euroway round negotiations. This is something that Henry Gao has um, emphasized. We moved toward, oh, let's go to the next thing. Uh, really not thinking about how we might fill gaps uh, in the WTO disciplines that uh, would be problematic looking ahead as, as China developed. Uh, so I think we both um, were failing to look directly at China and we got absorbed not only about what was happening um, in Iran and Iraq, which of course took majority of policymakers uh, energies, uh, but we then pushed in ways that failed to kind of digest uh, what the system had already, you know, uh, taken a big bite out of, which is let's take this gigantic, growing, fast growing economy and, and integrate it. Great. Um, look, let's turn a little bit toward the economics of this, because I, I think one of the big drivers of, of the perhaps elite discussions about the problems with China, um, China's accession to the WTO is the so-called China shock. Um, and, and for those of Viewers not aware, in 2016, three economists, David Otter, David Dorn, and Gordon Hansen, released a pretty famous paper uh, entitled The China Shock, Local Labor Market Effects and Import of Import Competition in the United States, uh, which built on some of their prior work. In essence, the paper argued that import competition from China uh, led to the loss of up to 2 million manufacturing jobs uh, in the United States and that our labor markets maybe aren't as fast or as quick to recover from shocks uh, as economists would have believed or once believed. Um, and I, I think, frankly, some bad faith critics have pounced on this. Um, and so there's more to the story, right? Um, and I'll, I'll start uh, perhaps with Dr. Lovely. Um, if you could kind of run us through maybe some of the, I don't know, pushback or, or maybe add a little nuance perhaps to the economics of, of this relationship. 
Yeah, I mean, the China shock has been an incredibly influential piece of academic work. It's a series of academic papers, really, and a website. Um, you know, every every academic's dream, I guess. But I think that it has been misused, and I think that it, on its face, is deeply misleading. I think the first thing is that there's no counterfactual here. What would have happened if China hadn't joined the WTO? And what we see is that a lot of the industries that they point out for job loss probably wouldn't be with us anyway. Uh, the world wasn't staying still. Uh, U.S. competitiveness in many of these sectors were falling. Would it have happened as fast or maybe to the extent that it did without China? Uh, one could argue about that. The answer is probably no, it wouldn't have happened that quickly, but it, it would have happened to some extent. And we have to remember that this was not going to be some golden years of, you know, U.S. furniture, textiles, apparel, whatever. Um, I think secondly is that it, it completely ignores the role of multinational enterprises in what, you know, uh, the great fragmentation that Richard Baldwin talks about. We had an information revolution that made it possible to separate stages of the production process so that U.S. could specialize in R&D, design, uh, accounting, financial services, um, and offshore manufacturing where wages were lower. Um, and this is really ignored, and I think that is um, to our detriment for a couple of reasons. One is we don't understand what we're doing when we put tariffs on Chinese goods. 60% of those goods coming in are produced by foreign invested enterprises, you know, like Foxconn for Apple or like Samsung. And of course, electronics is the heaviest part of the bundle of things we import from China. So we don't really understand the implications of putting tariffs on those for global value chains and for our allies. Secondly, it completely ignores the widespread gains that China's entry into the global system allowed. This is the, I think, the worst part. Many of us have benefited, and I count myself among that because higher education clearly gained. Uh, you know, I spent 30 years as a college professor, um, and that included not just me, uh, but the people who, who take care of our grounds, secretaries, uh, assistants, graduate students, um, computer industry. Yes, parts of it, we don't, you know, assembly left, but um, things like marketing, design, R&D exploded. Um, so, and then there's, of course, the price reductions, which were vital to making sure that electronic people say, oh, you know, who cares if a housewife can buy a blouse for a little bit less money? I find that quite irritating because, first of all, that's important to that household. And secondly, much of what we buy from China are inputs and capital goods. Um, and the fact that you can have a computer on every desk, and we had it before other countries, helped us to increase our productivity. Now, where did all these gains go? If, if, if I'm right and there's all these gains, where did they go? Autor, you know, Autor Donna Hansen found all the people who have languished and not to diminish their uh, suffering, um, we have to recognize the full picture to be able to think what's the best policy. And where the gains went is into the tremendous run up in tech stocks, uh, in uh, university endowments, um, in salaries for people who had college degrees. So there were a lot of people in US economy who gained. And I think that that's in fact, almost an unpopular thing to say. Uh, we were unable to capture enough of those gains to really try to ameliorate some of the, the downside effects on workers. It's a difficult thing because as Autor Dawn and Hansen showed and have continued to show through more recent work, uh, workers don't leave places that are dying very easily. Um, perhaps they're locked in through housing markets, age, health, community ties, whatever. We don't understand this very well. Um, and it's a problem, not only for our integration with China, but also for coming automation, which is also going to mean uh, fewer jobs or even the green transition. So it's vital that we, I think, honestly look at this situation and say there was a lot of wealth created here. We didn't do a very good job of distributing it. I think, yeah, I would. I, I think that's right. I, I would note that in Scott Lincecum in his piece this week on uh, China's the, the 20, 20 year anniversary, I noted a 2019 paper that found that import competition significantly lowered prices on various goods in the U.S. and generated about $410,000 in consumer surplus per job lost. 
Um, and so, you know, those are tremendous benefits, uh, but obviously that's, that's tough. That's a tough political argument perhaps to make uh, in a dying Rust Belt city or, or whatever. Um, let's talk a little bit about the frictions that currently exist in this relationship, because I think even, you know, the most ardent critics of PNTR and, and, and China's accession to the WTO um, would acknowledge that there are significant, or that, that that had passed in, you know, that was like a 10 year shock, right? Uh, but, but it's been over for about 10 years. Um, and, and, and there are still frictions that exist. Uh, let's talk about some of those uh, sort of as they currently exist or as the US and Western governments perceive them. Um, and and I, I'll start with Simon, you know, the, the, as I mentioned in the introduction, the United States issued the, the Section 301 report uh, again, sort of an indictment of the broad commercial practices of, of the Chinese government, but but talk about what what sort of plagues this relationship right now. Well, I guess it depends. I mean, it depends on who you're talking about in sort of the U.S. government among policymakers, because I mean, there's different views out there. There's different people saying different things, and and the the Donald Trump Bob Lighthizer view of things was well, there's a trade deficit. So, you know, that's the problem. And, you know, what's underneath it all is kind of irrelevant. Just go fix the trade deficit. And, you know, as part of the, the phase one deal, you know, they're, they're one of their uh, methods they wanted to use to fix it was to say, well, China just has to buy more U.S. products. And, you know, we can all, uh, sort of just about every economist and those of us who are not economists, but know a bit of economists, look at that and say, well, that just doesn't make any sense. That's not how it works. That's not what bilateral trade deficit means. That's not what trade deficit means. These purchase commitments won't work. But we had, nevertheless, we had a president that lead trade, you know, trade policy person in the U.S., trade policy official, who, who that's how they thought about it. And so that's what we did for, for a while. Um, we also then have people saying, well, there are all these structural problems in the, the Chinese economy, and that encompasses a, a number of different things, um, protection of intellectual property, uh, state-owned enterprises, subsidies, you know, other barriers to, to, to market access. And that's where I think there's sort of more unity, sort of agreement that, okay, these are real problems. And then the question is just, well, what's, what's the strategy? You know, what, what do you do? How do you induce, how do you push China um, to, to make some changes? And I, and I think there's a conventional wisdom out there that's sort of so obvious and it, you know, clearly right that, I mean, I'll just say, I mean, working with allies, instead of doing it ourselves, instead of the US alone, basically alone trying to push China, well, why don't we bring in the Europeans and the Japanese and the Australians and the Brazilians, because they must have similar concerns, right? Um, and and I, I will give the Biden administration credit. I mean, I think they are trying to do that. Um, I think it's hard to do. I think it's hard to coordinate with anybody on anything. Um, but I think that it certainly it, it makes sense to, to, to do that. And so then, then I think the question is, well, what kind of international agreement, what kind of rules, what kind of do, domestic and they can be coordinated actions would you need to address the various problems? So you know, we, can, we can identify the behavior of state-owned enterprises as a problem, or we can identify Forced technology transfer as a problem, or we can identify insufficient intellectual property protection as a problem. And these are these are sort of broad things to say. And within that, it's actually pretty complicated to figure out what actually is a problem. You know, how much intellectual property protection do we need? Maybe we're actually overdoing it. Um, but nevertheless, you know what 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 we need, and uh, you know, I think, and you know, I'm not the only one. Many people think this. You know, we we need clear identification of the problems, um, sorting out what kind of rules. Um, could be useful here to, to discipline the, the, the Chinese practices, and then what kind of coordinated actions, and then sort of at the national level implementation of that coordination, um, what do we need? So I, I don't know, there's nothing sort of radical or, or that insightful about all of that, uh, but it, it, I think that's just sort of kind of obvious, uh, you know, identifying the problems and, and figuring out the solutions, and you would think, well, why don't we just do that? Um, I mean, a lot of other things get in the way and it's hard and it's easy to sort of state it in the abstract, but when you get down to the details, it's, it's really hard. So I think, you know, we may talk later about the issue of, of, of subsidies, you know, just defining a subsidy and, you know, we, we already have this existing framework, well, how would we then expand on it? And, you know, can we actually agree? I mean, can, can economists figure out what a subsidy is and which were the bad ones and which are the good ones? Uh, and then can governments uh, you know, sort of internally, uh, you know, reach agreement on that, and then externally, can they all agree with each other? And, and that's where it gets difficult. Juan? Uh, 
Yeah, um, as you, as Simon said, the Biden administration did uh, start doing uh, more collaborative work with allies, but it also an, inherited a lot of uh, trade policies uh, from its predecessor when it comes to China. So we're having these tariff tariffs are staying, uh, and there seems to be no plan to remove them uh, or to lift them. And then we have this phase one deal, which the Biden administration seems um, uh, determined to enforce it, although I'm not sure how. Um, and then we're seeing this, uh, the White House and Congress are both trying to, uh, from all angles, to restrict imports from China, um, limit exports to China, uh, and then uh, tighten screening of Chinese investments here. Uh, so um, forgive me for being a little pessimistic here, and I hope they I truly hope I'm wrong, but I just do not see a very bright future for uh, getting China on board on anything. I mean, yes, working with the allies and coming up uh, proposals and new international rules is certainly great. That's a good start, but it does not mean anything if you do not have to do not bring China on board. Uh, but if we bring China into the picture, um, for instance, if we want to talk about subsidies, and China has been saying for years that we need to have agriculture subsidies talk to, is the US is willing to give that? Uh, and if we want to talk about state owned enterprises with China, and China said, okay, then you should uh, lift some of the restrictions, export restrictions to Chinese tech companies if I'm going to cut them off from the government. Is the US willing to do that? So, I mm, mean, that's um, it's probably an internal calculation uh, within the Biden administration what they're willing to give, but um, right now it doesn't seem like the, the political atmosphere allows them to offer anything in return. Dr. Lovely. Well, I can see why one would feel pessimistic. So um, it, there's some fear that we missed our moment in some way. Trust is at such a low level right now. And frankly, it does seem like trade, uh, antitrust, other types of uh, policies are being used really for commercial conflict. I won't say warfare, but I'll say conflict. And I think that um, this could get worse because uh, if you listen to the experts, we're on the cusp of another technological revolution uh, with AI, Internet of Things, blah, blah, blah. We all hear about it every day. But it seems to me in talking with tech companies now that it really is close. It's closer than it's been. And uh, that means that I think in all these in industries, there's going to be enormous economies of scale, which mean that there's enormous rents to be made, just as it were in the first wave. And that making sure that your national champions are the ones who dominate is going to be irresistible for politicians. And then that will lead to conflict because China, frankly, right now in the tech space, China is our only serious rival. Um, there are many other fine companies out there. I don't want to say there aren't many fine European companies, uh, Japanese companies, South Korean companies, but right now on in certain areas like AI, we have this, this rival and um, where does that go? We, we were told that we're gonna be systemic rivals and we're gonna compete and we're gonna cooperate. What does all that mean? I think uh, Simon mentioned turning to allies and that is a very important word in Washington right now, but it's just not going to be the panacea that, that some might hope. Um, what is a subsidy? He mentioned one person's subsidy uh, that is illegal, you know, can be viewed as illegal, can be used as burst wiggly net. What about the subsidies to EV adoption? You know, uh, and Biden's proposal to reward uh, companies that use union labor uh, and leave out Mexican labor, for example. So we're going to have trouble just right here at home with the USMCA. So what are the subsidies? Uh, Juan mentioned agricultural. Is the US gonna be, you know, grow up and be honest about this? Or are we gonna keep saying that it's other people's subsidies that are the problem? So I don't think that this is a panacea. I think we're, despite the trilateral uh, agreement or statement and process that's being done by the US, Europeans and Japanese, which offer kind of the best hope, there's still a very long way to go. And then of course we have to multilateralize that. So I think that's a big problem. 
I think also, um, and if we have one ray of hope, it might be to try to look at US export expansion. When, you know, Washington, every time you, you hear this litany of, of complaints against China and they include SOEs, and, and you really want to say, in what way are, are the SOEs? Is, are, is, it, is it through our imports? Because our imports don't primarily come from SOEs. They come from foreign invested enterprises operating in China. Is it by blocking our exports? And there you do see much more SOE on the buyer side. Um, and as buyers of US multinationals operating in China. So why don't we have that conversation? What is it exactly about the SOEs that are, that are preventing American commercial interests from bearing the type of benefits that we think they're due? So I think we have a lot more conversation. Um, it's easy to be depressed. I still like to think that leaving the lines of communication open and good policy analysis can help us, but I certainly do understand that sentiment. Um, let's talk about, uh, Juan, you and, and Simon have done really good work. There, there's a belief, right, uh, and, and Bob Lighthizer, when he was USTR, said this at CSIS, he was asked, uh, you know, to what extent did the U.S. think about using dispute settlement at, at the WTO to try to discipline some of these complaints? Um, and he basically blew the question off and said, look, we just don't think that can work, and so we're not going to go down that road. Uh, but, but Juan, when you and Simon were at Cato, uh, you produced a pretty good paper uh, with Jim Backus, sort of going through all of the disputes that have been filed against China and, and the actions that they have taken. Uh, can you both you and Simon sort of talk through uh, what your paper found and whether or not that's still a viable option to pursue some of these higher level disputes between the US and China? Okay, I'll, I'll start. Uh, so yes, it's much easier to say, oh, it doesn't work. Uh, but it's uh, it takes much more work to look into the the cases and what happened since. So um, as part of that paper, I uh, looked at um, WTO cases brought against China since uh, the first case in 2004. So there were uh, 47 complaints and some of the complaints were brought that they shared the same legal basis or uh, target the same Chinese measures. So I grouped them together. Um, so Together we have 33 uh, matters, which uh, covers a wide range of issues like subsidies, the trade remedies, uh, trading rights, um, trading services, and intellectual property rights. Um, so, so far, um, I would say almost 20%, uh, almost um, half of them uh, were litigated all the way through with adopted DSB rulings and recommendations and another half, almost half uh, were resolved through settlements or volunteer actions or something similar. And we still have a handful of cases that are still pending. Uh, and my finding is that following through what, uh, following what China had done uh, after the, the rulings uh, in, as a result of these litigations, it, either there were ruling or uh, there was no, and it was a settlement. Um, China actually changed its behavior and made them more consistent with WTO rules. That's my conclusion. Uh, there were a couple cases where people disagreed on whether there was a full compliance or not. Uh, the details of these cases are always more nuanced than people tend to believe. Uh, but ne China never outright ignored a WTO ruling, and there was never a WTO member requested retaliation against China until the U.S. did it first time last year. So um, in comparison, uh, the U.S. and other Western countries uh, didn't re really set up a very good role model here. Um, the U.S. had ignored WTO rulings on subsidies and anti-dumping measures, uh, and the EU uh, also didn't comply with the WTO rulings on hormone treated beef. And then we have the EU and U.S. Uh, were engaged in the Boeing Airbus dispute over aircraft subsidies, in which they fought for almost two decades. Uh, each Both sides were criticizing the other side to not fully complying. Uh, and of course, eventually they settled it uh, this year, but still it lasted for almost two decades. So overall, looking at the full picture, uh, I say 
compared to you know other large economies, I say China's compliance record is pretty good, and I believe the DSB is an is effective in uh, correcting China's some trade behaviors, uh, and so I think there are uh, more rooms to bring more cases. Um, as uh, when China joined the WTO, it made a lot of uh, WTO plus uh, commitments, and some of them are related to SOEs and technology transfer. Uh, so uh, our negotiators work really hard to get these provisions in. So why not take advantage of the fact that they're already in there uh, and then you know bring cases against China. Uh, but before we do that, before we bring new cases, I suggest the U.S. restore the pilot body first. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good first step. Uh, Simon, uh, do you have anything to add? Not much to add to that. I mean, just but you know, Juan mentioned the big caveat is that well, there's no appellate body, and that that's that's, that's the problem right now. Now, you know, uh, as many people know, uh, China and a number of other countries have have set up this alternative to the appellate body. So, so uh, you know, uh, called the MPIA. So, so other countries could bring complaints against uh, China. Um, you know, based on on these or other obligations, um, the U.S. is not in a position to do so uh, because China would have the ability to appeal the case into the void and, and block it. Um, yeah, I did, the only thing I would add is just, so, you know, when you think about how effective WTO dispute settlement is, I mean, nobody's going to argue that it's perfect and it gets compliance in every case. It, it's a question of degree. Uh, you know, I would say that WTO dispute settlement is, is pretty good at getting some degree of compliance, you know, and that relates that that that, that pertains to China and everybody else. I mean, it, it's never going to be perfect, but it will get you some way. But what you need to compare it to is what would you do other than WTO dispute settlement? And if the answer is Section 301, well, how well has that worked? I mean, the Trump administration, you know, did that. And so where are we in terms of, of China's compliance? I mean, so what, where we are is both sides have higher tariffs on, on each other, and, and that's not compliance. That's sort of taking us in the other direction. What I think is interesting and sort of, you know, I, I try to be as objective as I can about these things. So there's this phase one deal, and it has in it some structural, you know, commitments in, in sort of structural areas, the intellectual property, um, and, and of course, technology transfer. And so I think there's a, a, an interesting question of to what degree has that induced any change in, in Chinese laws and policies? And my general sense, and I think this would have to be left for you know, a, a, another panel another day, um, it, is that China has made moves in a number of areas, but they are often moves that would have been that they that China was making anyway. So I'm just I'm not really sure to what extent we could say that Section 301 and the phase one deal have actually induced any change in, in China. But I think you, uh, for, for to answer a question like that, I think you'd really have to get into specifics and you'd have to look at examples and you have to say, well, this you know, provision of the phase one deal says this and you know, China changed its law this way, um, but were they about to do that anyway? So I think it's a, it's a complicated question, but on balance, I, I, you know, my view is that WTO dispute settlement you know, works better than the alternatives. Although it's not perfect, it works better than the alternatives at inducing these sort of structural changes in, in Chinese, you know, uh, policy. Um, I know Juan uh, sort of expressed her deep pessimism uh, about this, but Simon, you you mentioned uh, Section three hundred one. Um, so obviously, in in early twenty twenty, the United States and China signed the so called Phase One Agreement, uh, and the again the legal basis in the U.S. for the sort of putting things in motion to get to that point was section 301 of, of the Trade Act. Um, but, but what does it say about the WTO system um, that the two largest economies in the world uh, took their fight sort of outside of its confines? And that was sort of the thing the WTO system was designed to prevent. Uh, but, but I'll start with Dr. Lovely, but again, sort of what, what does that say about sort of where we are and where we're headed with the WTO system? Oh, I was looking forward to Simon's answer to that question. <laughs> um, you know, it's hard to constrain power, and these two economies have power. In the end, um, as I always, you know, my students uh, who often say the WTO is making us do this or making us do that in the environment or labor standards, or whatever, I always say yes. It's two hundred strong PhDs there. You know, uh, we in the end. Um, People abide by W or countries abide by WTO rulings and adhere to the, to the disciplines because they see it in their interests. Um, and 
what has happened may be telling us something about how the institution has to change. I think there has to be a bit more room for countries to pull back. Frankly, the US wants to pull back. Um, maybe it's domestic politics, maybe it's good economics. I don't particularly think so, but uh, there are some who do. And um, they want to do it through higher anti-dumping countervailing duties, perhaps. And I think there has to be more of this kind of um, escape, you know, pressure release uh, in the system for the system to, to remain stable. I'd be interested to hear Simon's views on that. And, um, you know, I think that Juan also um, repeatedly has raised the Chinese position in Chinese agency here. And we have to acknowledge that the U.S. in some sense started this fight. Um, and this has certainly led China to, I think, rethink uh, the WTO and the disciplines and the, and the, and the, the um, rules that they can depend upon. Uh, so how will they re-engage? So they have been active or more active over time in the WTO. Um, how will they come in and what kinds of disciplines on their subsidies or SOE activity would they be willing to accept? Again, it's going to have to make sense to them. We often say, China, we can't change. Now the world is over. We can't change China. We've got to start. To, we, we need to turn our back because we can't change them. What we need to do, I think, is to look for room where we can find mutually gainful uh, changes, mutually gainful just uh, rules uh, that constrain each of us from doing things like the tit for tat tariffs, which frankly have left both of us um, worse off. Fine. Yeah, so first, let me just address Mary's escape valve point, which I think is a good one. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it is important to have good functional escape valves in there. And I think one of the problems is maybe we didn't. I mean, safeguards are supposed to be that escape valve, but maybe they, they're not as easy to use as, as, as we'd like them to be. And instead, what we've used is anti-dumping. And I just feel like there's, there's a fundamental problem with using anti-dumping the way we're doing it, because it involves an accusation that somebody's doing something unfairly, um, even though there's no evidence of that. And so we constantly, every, not every government, but all the big governments throughout the world are imposing anti-dumping duties on each other. And politicians talk about that as the other side is cheating. So everybody believes everyone else is cheating. Um, and you know, at that point, how do you have the trust to sit down when you've just instilled in, in so many people in positions of power? Well, the other, those guys are cheating. Um, so then how do you go sign a trade deal with them? Uh, in, in terms of your, your sort of broader question about what the phase one deal means for the WTO, well, I mean, it's not good. Um, and it shows you the limits of the WTO. I mean, I would say that we've seen the limits of the WTO for, for many years now as governments have gone outside the WTO to negotiate bilateral and regional and plurilateral trade agreements. But having said all that, let me put in a plug for the WTO because I think one of the problems I have with all of these FTAs is, you know, it, it's a nice... Uh, event. It's a nice signing ceremony. Hey, we've signed this big new trade deal. Um, and then what happens to it? I don't know. Once a year, maybe there's a meeting of the, the, the you know, each, each government with a short readout of what happened. But, but it doesn't seem like they're, they're sort of very active. They're not sort of living agreements for and, and many of them just get forgotten. In contrast, at the WTO, there is so much work being done there. Now, you know, you, you could sort of, you know, diminish it and say, well, nothing, subs nothing concrete comes out of it. But if you read through the, the, the minutes of the meetings that the WTO is holding on such a wide range of to topics, so many more than, than, than we've been brought up today, they are, this is in, 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 in a really crucial place for all governments around the world, just about all, to sit down and talk about trade issues together. Um, will, they, will they come up with a big new round and a big new agreement? You know, probably not. Um, but, but to me, they accomplished so much with the Uruguay round that I'm really okay with taking some time to digest what we did and refine it, fill in the gaps, think about how we can improve it, and just get, you know continue to have the, these meetings where we talk through all the issues. I, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I don't know that we need to get to, um, you know, it, I think as Mary said earlier, it's sort of we sign the Uruguay round. Okay, what comes next? Everyone's always excited for what's next. You know, we've done a lot. Let's just figure out how to make that work. Um, and I think that's maybe more realistic in, 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 instead of just always trying to, okay, what's the next issue we can add in there? You know, uh, so, so I, I think the WTO, you know, there, there's always, it's always in crisis. People are always worried that it's, you know, it, it's falling apart. But I, I think that if we can just keep doing what we're doing and, and keep the rules 
functioning, like bring back the appellate body, I, I'll, I'll be satisfied. I'll be happy. I, I don't. I don't expect um, whatever comes next after the WTO. We don't need to double what we've accomplished. Let's just uh, let's just try to make what we have work. And if anybody, real quick, if anybody has any questions, we are running out of time, but shoot them in the chat and I can uh, sort of ask, ask them once they're there. Uh, my final question um, is, is not the WTO, uh, but, but where will the US-China economic relationship be in 10 years from now? Uh, and, and not where do you want it to be, but where do you think it will be? Uh, you know, I'm our, I'm friends with, with Dan Eikenson, uh, former director of the uh, Trade Policy Center there at Cato. Um, and, and Dan and I were having a conversation and he recently said, look, I, I think no matter what we wanna say, um, the, the commercial relationship will be subordinated to broader geopolitical and geo, you know, economic and national security concerns. Um, so, so I'll go around quickly. Where, where do you think this will be in, in 10 years? Dr. Lovely. Oh Lord, that's a that's a big one. Um, I guess my fear is that we will see increasing regionalization, um, with particularly in Asia, and I think Asia is poised to play this game better, partly because of RCEP and it's the rules of origin there, which really encourage accumulation of value in the region, um, uh, and also because you know I think that. Uh, they're not as ready to put up trade barriers based on a variety of issues that we might think are, are worth trade barriers, such as human rights issues. Um, on, when we look at North America, we see a US which is um, actually has pulled back from uh, Mexico and Canada, Me uh, Mexico by um, making it more difficult for the US auto industry to produce there in, through the new USMCA rules. Um, and Canada in the new rules, which uh, will benefit US made EVs to the exclusion of Can Canadian uh, on the user side subsidies that the Biden administration hopes to get through. So um, I fear that it'll be a, 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 a global economy where the US is increasingly to some extent isolated. Um, and that's uh, something I hope we might be able to um, save off with, with some improvements in, in policy. Uh, trade policy and Asia policy. One. Um, I agree with Mary that in the future we'll probably will see more focus on regional trade. Uh, at least uh, that seems like what's going to happen in uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, in terms of U.S. China, um, well, on the, the um, uh, USTR, Catherine Tai uh, gave a speech on October. Uh, saying that um, the U.S. will re, 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 re recouple with China. So what, well, she didn't elaborate on the term, but my interpretation is uh, um, the U.S. will decouple with China uh, in some sectors uh, like high tech, uh, semiconductor, uh, and then continue trading with China in uh, low tech sectors. Um, so if we continue the, the current trajectory, uh, I, I think that may be uh, how the trade relations uh, will turn out to be. Um, but I also I'm concerned about the ge ge geopolitical power um, competition may get in the way of trade too. Simon, last word. I think that, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said and there are obviously real geopolitical tensions. I think in the end, a lot of the trade flows will end up being pretty much the same, like on agriculture and, and some industrial products. But the one area that really worries me is anything related to data. And so when I hear about, you know, the Internet of Things, I think Mary mentioned that earlier, you know, I just start to wonder, you know, to what extent will data be incorporated in every industrial product and maybe even in food products somehow, I, I don't know. And data just seems like something that both governments are really worried about. And you know, there might be, you know, there, there's going to be a few sectors um, that maybe we really just can't trade with each other because there's just this total lack of trust. Now, I mean, data is a bigger issue than just the US China. So it may be that, you know, governments all around the world are going to need to sort out um, what they think about data and, and how they coordinate their, their data regulation. Maybe as part of that, 
um, you know, whatever, whatever, it, whatever China's practices are, you know, maybe we can reach agreement, but I'm, I'm a little doubtful. So I just, I, I see, I don't see broad decoupling, you know, trade's not going to stop, um, you know, it, but it may, it may fall, you know, 20%, there may be sort of 20% of our trade investment relationship that's just in areas that are too sensitive, mostly related to data, some related to what China is, is doing with the data, how they're, how they're using it in certain, you know, surveillance practices and, and rights issues. Um, so, so I think we're going in sort of a, a, a decoupling direction, um, it, it, but I mean, it's not going to be complete decoupling, but I mean, there, there certainly be, be areas where in 10 years from now, we won't have worked it out um, and that'll, that'll, that'll be where we are. You've left, uh, left us on a really depressing note. Uh, so with that, um, there are no questions. Um, I appreciate all the panelists' time. I appreciate all the viewers uh, tuning in. This is a rich conversation. Um, it's a really important topic. Uh, and so with that, uh, we'll call it a day. Have a Merry Christmas and Happy Holiday. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Take care. Thanks to everybody. Thanks, Clark. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you. Happy Holidays.